Consider a meter stick common in physics classrooms. Every part of the meter stick is pulled downward by gravity, as shown by these sample vectors. All the vectors added together make up the weight of the stick. The average downward pull of gravity acts at a certain point, called the center of gravity. For the stick, the center of gravity is at the 50 centimeter mark, where we place a dot. We can support the weight of the stick by a finger placed just below the center of gravity. Then the stick is in equilibrium, where your applied force F balances its weight mg. We can also talk about the center of mass of an object. That's the average location of all the object's mass. In everyday cases, center of mass and center of gravity are in the same location. So we can use center of gravity and center of mass interchangeably. Where's the center of gravity or center of mass of a donut? Aha, it's in the center of the hole. So center of gravity or center of mass on something may be in a location where no mass or weight exists. And we see that the center of gravity of a boomerang, likewise, is where no mass or weight exists. When the boomerang is tossed in the air, it appears to wobble all over the place. What place? That's right the center of gravity. It's the center of gravity that follows a smooth path as the boomerang wobbles about it. Consider this L-shaped piece of plywood. Its center of gravity, like the boomerangs, is at this point, outside the mass. This is the average location of all the wood's weight. For some purposes, it's as if all the wood's weight is located there. Because of its center of gravity, balancing of the wood can be interesting. Let's drop in on an early City of College of San Francisco conceptual physics class and see how balancing such a piece of wood leads to a fascinating topic, torque. Let's suppose I want to balance this like this, except for the motion this way. We see it doesn't rotate this way, does it? Because the center of gravity is right here, and boom, there's a support underneath. But how about I tip it like this? You know it's going to topple over. Everybody knows that. Children know that. It's going to topple right over. Now, we have a way of looking at that. Let's look at it on the board. Here's my L-shaped object sitting on the table. Center of gravity of that object is right about here. That means all Mother Earth is pulling down on that object as if all its matter were right there. And so we can draw arrow down here for the weight. But notice something. This force pulling down is not supported. It rocks about this part here, doesn't it? This is like, like, like a seesaw rocking or something that's rocking. It's going to rock about an imaginary fulcrum. You know what a fulcrum is? The middle of a seesaw, the fulcrum is the part about which rotation takes place, OK? Or if I take this book and I rotate it, the fulcrum would be what? Right in here, the point, the axis of rotation, OK? So here's my axis of rotation right in here. And so I get a pull, whoop, a flip, and a rock right over. Now it's going to rock right over like that because of something we haven't discussed yet. This force gives rise to a twist. Loosely speaking, you can say we have a twisting force here. But non-loosely speaking, that twisting force is called a, anyone know? Begins with T, ends with orc. Torque, OK? It turns out you will have a torque on this object. And let me define torque. Torque is the product of how hard something pulled, forced. By the leverage, the leverage arm distance, the lever distance. So what we have here is a torque, a force through some leverage distance. Now what's the distance? That's crucial. The lever arm distance is not the distance between the point about which rotation takes place and the center of gravity. That is not the leverage distance. 
The leverage distance is this distance in here, that distance. And the leverage distance is always the shortest distance between the axis of rotation and not the point of application, but the line of action of the force. This force goes all the way down. That line of action right here, and that the shortest distance right in there. It's always a right angle. You take that force, multiply it by that distance, you will have a number which is called torque. And if you have an unbalanced torque on any system, that system is going to change how it rotates. We say it will rotationally accelerate. So if it's at rest to begin with, and it's a torque, whoop, it's going to flip. Over it goes. Back to our screencast. A nice way to distinguish between force and torque involves this activity, which you should try for yourself. If you hold a meter stick at one end with a stick extended horizontally and with a weight suspended from its midpoint, you feel a rotational tendency of the stick. You have to hold it tight and give it some opposite twist, that is, some opposite torque, to keep it from rotating. If the weight is moved to the end, holding becomes more difficult. But wait, there has been no change in the magnitude of force involved, just a different location for the force. What you feel isn't a difference in forces, what you feel is a difference in torques. As mentioned in the classroom lesson, we define torque as torque equals force multiplied by lever arm distance. In the first position, the distance between your hand and the hanging weight was less than when it was moved to the end of the stick. What has changed is the lever arm. When the lever arm is doubled, the torque, which you readily feel, is doubled. People who use tools are familiar with the torque produced with a common wrench. Here we see your hand exerting a force on the end of the wrench. What you want to do is rotate the bolt, colored purple here, that's in the jaws of the wrench. For maximum torque for a given force, you exert the force at 90 degrees, a right angle to the wrench handle. We see the lever arm is just about the length of the handle. If you instead exert the same amount of force at a non-right angle to the handle, the torque you'll provide is different. Here's my question. In which of these two cases are you more likely to turn the stubborn bolt? Did you say the first case? If so, you're correct. And did you reason that the lever arm is greater in the first case? Yum to that. We see in the first case the lever arm is the full length of the wrench handle. The lever arm is the perpendicular distance between the pivot point and the line of action of the force. Note the shorter lever arm distance. Perchance the bolt is really stubborn and you can't get it to rotate, extend the lever arm with a pipe. Now you can exert even more torque. Yum! I want to leave you with a question. If you use a pipe to extend the lever arm of the wrench, so your grip is three times as far from the bolt, and you pull twice as hard as before, at right angles to the pipe, by how much will the torque you produce increase? That's the grip is three times as far and the pull is twice as hard? Think about that. Until next time, good energy. Mm -hmm.